right, let's see if it is live and see if you can hear me. I'm hoping you can hear me. I'm going to keep trying on this other computer screen, seeing if you can hear me. Otherwise, I don't know what it is. <laughs> so, videos live. I just don't know if you can hear me. Somebody tell me if you can hear me. Oh, somebody says I can hear me. Let's see. I'll feel better if I get a little more. I don't know what it was. Yes, Naomi says yes. Thank you very much. All right, Naomi. Thank you. I don't know what it was. I'm sorry. I will tell you that. Um, see if you can still hear me there. Um, hopefully you can. I don't know. You know, technology, I, I keep telling Debbie Zell there's something wrong with my computer, and I think there is. Um, and so uh, thank you for being here with me today. It is 6.25 p.m on a great wonderful monday in fort stockton texas july 20th i'm going to go over quite a bit a few things today and i am going to start right now um so thank you again for being patient i am so glad that you can hear me um you delilah was over here yelling at me a minute ago saying i can't hear you i'm like yeah i know everybody's telling me so let's go ahead and start let me get this slide ready i'm gonna share screen and we're off to the races all right hopefully we get this done in 30 minutes um see if you guys can see the screen it just says uh fsi or fort Stockton independent school district um what does learning look like part one this will be part one and just want to make sure you can see the screen yeah uh, oh man yes you can all right so before we go on, I need everybody to watch this video. This is what we got from the Commissioner of Education on Friday. It's about a two and a half minute video. Watch it, enjoy it. Um, it is much different listening to him speak like this because we know he's reading this. He's doing a great job, but as far as reading it, but I just want you to understand what we're playing, what we're dealing with. Okay, and this is a video that was done on uh, Friday. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and play it to our teachers staff and parents. My name is Mike Morath, Commissioner of the Texas Education Agency. We live in unnerving times. COVID has been a major disruption in all of our lives, both personally and professionally. I've talked to so many teachers and parents around the state of Texas who are itching to see kids back in classrooms, students who want to see their friends and their teachers, teachers want to get back in classrooms and I've also talked to many teachers and parents who are nervous about what this means and how how can it be done safely. We at TEA have spent the last several months talking to medical experts around the state around the country as well as examining how schools are being reopened around the globe and we've crafted a framework so that schools can open safely subject to a variety of adjustments to keep our staff and our students safe. We know that there are parents who are nervous and who want to keep their children home. And for that, we will support them with remote instruction 100% of the way. But we also know that the on-campus instructional environment is invaluable, that a child's academic and social growth flourishes in a Texas public school. As a result, our framework ensures that there will be on-campus instruction available for all students who need it in the state of Texas. But at the same time, we know we need to provide local schools flexibility to adapt to local health conditions, especially given the rise in COVID cases that we're seeing across the state. Today, we've announced that every school that needs it can adopt a four week back to school transition window where instruction can be fully virtual if need be. This should give us time to work collectively to flatten the curve on this epidemic. And at the same time, if that is insufficient time, local school boards have the ability to adopt an additional four week transition window, should that be necessary. To our Texas teachers, what you do in normal times is nothing short of extraordinary, helping eager young minds become the best versions of themselves. But these are not normal times. We will support flexibility at the local level to ensure that all of our schools remain safe and are available to our kids. Thank you to teachers and parents across the state of Texas. God bless. 
All right, so that is a slide that I wanted you to see. Uh, and then within that, the, within that information, there was some information, within that video, there was also a lot of information given to us. Um, and one of the pieces of information was the health guidance from TEA, which was uh, updated on July 17, 2020. And it's about nine pages long. And so I am actually going to go over that with you here so you can see. Uh, I'll do the best I can as fast as I can. Hopefully you guys can still see that screen. And it is the public health guidance. I kind of went through it a little bit. Um, it, and I highlighted areas where we just need to know that we have to go over. Um, so with that being said, I am going to go over that fast as I can. So we all know what's on the on as far as uh, what we're dealing with when it comes to um, what's going on uh, right now. Um, this document you can find on TEA's website. It's called the S School Year 2021 Public Health Planning Guidance. And I am going to just want to make sure you can see that screen. Um, if you notice, I don't know, I'm going to have to stop sharing. That's what I need to do. Okay. All right. Good. So this is the document that we're going to go over. And if you notice here, I'm going to go spotlight. Let me just make sure I get it because it is quite a bit of information. Yes. All right. So the document here is called the S school year 2021 public health planning guidance document. And if you notice, we are going to go, it's about nine pages long. I highlighted some areas that I feel are most important for us. Um, some of the things are the public health considerations. You can get this information from TEA's website. Um, and there's a, a, a statement here that says, while it's not possible to eliminate the risk of furthering the spread of COVID-19, to eliminate all risk of furthering the spread of COVID-19, the current science suggests there are many steps schools can take to reduce the risk uh, to students, teachers, staff, and their families significantly. Um, some of the things that says we have to do is provide notice of parental uh, to the parents, requirements for parental and public notices. We have to prevent by required practices to prevent the virus. Uh, respond by required practices to respond if we do have someone who tests positive uh, and then mitigate recommend and required practices to reduce likely spread inside the schools all right so that being said tea says some practices are required for all school systems and some are not uh, consistent uh, and the, the big thing here is that extent feasible uh, that's kind of thing because it's kind of they tell you what it is and they say you know do the very best you can as far as the extent feasible uh, systems should consider stringent, str I don't know, stringently, stringently, I think, as applying recommended practices to adults' campuses, even when it might not be feasible to do so for students. So it says extent feasible, but then it says might not be feasible. So again, you're doing the best you can to minimize the spread of COVID-19 and have practices in place. Now, developing a plan. We mentioned last week that we have to give a summary of the plan one week prior the school start year. Uh, the summary document can follow any format the school system deems appropriate. Um, neither this summary document nor any school system's reopening plans are subject to approval by any government entity. Again, it's just a school saying these are the plans. Attendance enrollment. It does say those students must attend 90% of the days of course and offered with some exceptions in order to be awarded credit for the course and or be promoted to the next grade. Uh, this requirement remains in force during the 2021 school year. Now keep this in mind. Yes, there is a 90% of attendance, but there is a different way that we have to do attendance. And so that's a, that'll be either tomorrow or Wednesday's explanation of what we're going on, okay? So given the public health situation, students' attendance may be earned through the delivery of virtual instruction, okay? So that is a different thing for us that we've had before, all right? So it says any parent may request that their student be offered virtual instruction from any school system that offers such instruction, all right? So we get we are giving people that that opportunity. If a parent who chooses a virtual instruction wants their child to switch to an on, on campus instruction setting, they can do so. But systems are permitted to limit these transitions to occur only at the end of a grading period. We've kind of looked at it with our principals and kind of decided three weeks and six weeks are are kind of the ideal place for the student and the teacher. Um, uh, if parents request virtual instruction at the school does not offer it. 
th this is kind of the deal here. This this is not us, but if a parent requests virtual instruction and the school does not offer it, the parent may enroll in another school that does offer it for transfer students. Now, what that in Fort Stockton, we are doing virtual. Uh, there are some schools, I think, that may not be doing it. Uh, we are one, a school district there that is doing that for this coming school year. Now, here's where it gets a little tricky, okay? School systems must provide on-campus attendance as an option for students. So as you heard the commissioner, we're, we're allowing uh, schools to have four weeks of virtual learning. But if you notice here, it does say school systems must provide on-campus attendance as an option for students. All right. Subject to school closure and exceptions listed in this document. And high school systems may, be, may offer less than daily on-campus instructional experience. That has a lot to do with the CTE classes and things like that. Um, be, it's a little bit different uh, that Mr. Alvarado and the high school uh, CTE career and technology teachers have to deal with. For example, you may have students, you know, who have to show how to weld a certain way. Well, you can't do that at home. Uh, you may have to have students come show the how to build things in wood shop and what have you. So that's what that's. It's kind of a big question mark why that is. We suspect that has to do with CTE and career and technology classes. Now, here's the here's the crazy thing. In order to facilitate um, safe, effective back to school transition process uh, during a period up to the four weeks of school, which can be extended additional four weeks, school systems may temporarily limit access to on campus instruction. So it's saying you can do virtually, not a big deal. Okay. Uh, some parents opting for their students to attend on campus may be required to start with remote instruction temporarily. So it says may be required. So it's saying you have four weeks, you can limit your school access to on-campus instruction to four weeks, and that if that's the case, we may have to require students to do remote instruction temporarily. But look at this, although any family who does not have internet access and or devices for distance learning at home is entitled to have their student receive on-campus instruction each day during the transition period. So. That is the confusion that people are getting in the state of Texas. And if you have to dissect this eight, nine page document to figure that out. So let me go again. It's telling you, yeah, you have four weeks to do online virtual instructions, may temporarily limit and you limit access to campus instruction. Um, and, and it may be required for people who want their kids to go to school uh, to be remote instruction temporarily. But although those kids who do not have access to the internet or devices at home, have to go to school. They're entitled to receive on-campus instruction. So is it virtual? You're right. I agree with you. And I know that some of you guys are concerned and because we got the phone calls this morning. You're you're not you're being very confusing and this and that. And let me tell you, I'm just as confused as you are. We're trying to figure this out. Again, this was you know done at Friday at one o'clock and people want people want you to work on it all weekend long and figure it out. And let me tell you, sometimes it's hard, okay? All right. So we do have to clearly describe the transition process in our posted summary. All right, not a big deal. We can do that. We have not have our su summary posted up yet. And again, it'd probably be a living and breathing document. School systems are required to pro provide parents with the public ed education, enrollment, and tenants rights and responsibilities during the COVID-19 pandemic using a document published by TEA. Guess what? We don't have that document yet, okay? We do not have this required parent notice of their public education, enrollment, and attendance rights and responsibilities from TEA. We don't have it. It's not out yet. Hopefully it'll be out this week. We don't know. Okay. Uh, but we nobody has that document right now. Uh, we have to prevent things. We must, it says school systems must require teachers and staff to self-screen. We knew that every single day. Um, it does say that it should include staff taking their own temperatures. It doesn't say they must, but it said they should. Uh, teachers and staff must report uh, although teachers must report that the school system or themselves, if they have COVID-19 or lab confirmed uh, COVID-19, which they've been doing that. So that's okay. Uh, if so, they must remain on campus until they meet the criteria. They must remain off campus once they meet the whole entire criteria for not having COVID-19. All right. Uh, basically, they have to report if they've been in close contact. Parents must ensure they do not send a child to school on campus if the child has COVID-19 symptoms as listed in this document. And it's at the right end of this document. I'll show you here in a little bit. Okay. Um, then it talks about the 14 day incubation period. School systems may consider screening students for COVID-19 as well. Um, it's kind of crazy. They, they tell you, you know, you can, you should consider screening students, but they don't tell you you have to, which is a little worrisome, but yet we do have to 
um, screen students in ways uh, by says here other electronic methods and we have to do so we are working on the best way to screen kids and it's going to be a collective yes no to the system to these symptoms it also says regular performing a forehead temperature check of otherwise asymptomatic students in school is not recommended, but the practice is also not prohibited by this guidance. So, hmm, it doesn't say you have to take the temperatures, but what is the best practice in situations like this? You probably need to do that. Uh, excluding parental drop off, it says we must screen all visitors and we must screen. Uh, to determine if visitors have been in close contact, period. So if you're at a school, you have to be screened, period. Uh, individuals with confirmed or suspected COVID-19, um, in case of individuals who have diagnosed, uh, it tells us that they have to meet three different criteria to return. Uh, so if you've been uh, diagnosed with it, you have it, you have to have at least three days to have passed since you recovered. So let's just say it's 14 days. I feel great. You still have to wait some two hours. The individual has improvement in symptoms. Um, but define improvement. What does that mean? I guess from when you improve, I guess if you're really sick and you you were coughing, you know, all day long to maybe just occasional, I guess that's improvement. We don't know. It's not really strictly defined here. Uh, and then at least 10 days have passed since the systems first appeared. So we got to meet all these three criteria before somebody can come back on campus. All right. Identifying, identifying possible COVID-19 cases on campus. Schools must immediately separate any student who shows COVID-19 symptoms while at school until the student can be picked up by the parent or guardian. School, schools should clean. Uh, students who report feeling feverish should be uh, given an immediate temperature check to determine if they're ace or symptomatic for COVID-19. So there's some issues there. So now we're gonna check the temperatures if they're feeling feverish, uh, but you really don't have to. We don't recommend it, but yes, we do. But I know that we are in Fort Stockton ISD. We're going to do the very best we can to do that. Uh, practices to respond to lab confirmed case in the school. These are practices that we have in place. First thing we have to do is uh, we do have to notify our local health department. Uh, we also have to follow the law and regulations with FERPA. And what FERPA is, is we have to be careful who knows that information. Schools must close off areas. Uh, it says here, and then it also talks about uh, cleaning. It says uh, surfaces must be clean unless more than three days have passed since the person was on campus. Uh, and here's the thing right here. Consistent with local notification requirements for other communicable di diseases and consistent with legal confidentiality requirements. In other words, we can't just out there and say uh, my son has coronavirus, whatever. We can't, we can't say the kid's name. We can't say the staff person's name. All we can say is that there was a student or a staff member who has been tested positive for coronavirus at the schools. And here it is, schools must notify all teachers and staff, families and students, uh, if a lab confirmed COVID-19 cases is identified among students, teachers uh, or staff who participate on any campus activities. We just have to be careful. We just can't say specifically who it is. Uh, we won't do that. Unfortunately, kids talk, uh, staff members talk, and what they put out on Facebook and what they put out all over the place, we're not really able to um, figure that out, you know, because they, they can say whatever they want. Okay, so health and hygiene. Schools should attempt to have hand sanitizer. We've, we've already ordered that. We're working on it. They want us to have it on the entrances, uh, to provide hand sanitizer, soap and water in every classroom. Students, uh, staff, visitors should be encouraged uh, to sanitize and wash your hands frequently. Uh, they should encourage them. Whether they do it or not, it's a different story. It's like, you know, there's a stop sign on this corner of this um, intersection right outside the central office. Uh, doesn't mean everybody stops at that stop sign, you know, even though they know they should. Same thing here. Yes, you should wash your hands. It says school systems are encouraged to teach students good hand washing techniques. If you've ever been in a elementary school, I would promise you that our wonderful teachers and aides and counselors and cafeteria ladies and janitors encourage good hand washing techniques to our kids. Um, they know how to do it. They've been taught. Um, they're reminded of it. We've already been doing that for a long time. Um, they, our teachers in, in all our campuses remind students of the proper hygiene uh, techniques that they should be doing. Now, whether they they do it or not, I don't know. Even in our daycare, cough, uh, cover coughs and sneezes with a tissue if not available, covered it in their elbows. I know that because my kid who goes to the daycare in the schools, he does that. He's been taught that in schools. And he's been reminded. Use tissues should be thrown in the trash. Uh, we, we've been remind, reminding all these people, all our students and staff to do that for a long time. That's uh, the only thing we will have to really focus on is at least doing for 20 seconds. All right. 
Uh, it says campuses uh, should have more frequent cleaning, additional cleaning by janitorial staff. Uh, be glad that our janitors work very hard and they are, are determined to do what's best for our kids. And they do a wonderful job of doing those things. Um, and they're going to have a tough job too. Clean that, and that we uh, have opportunity for children to clean their own spaces before and after they're used uh, if it's safe and developmentally appropriate. Um, it may be in a situation where a kid isn't able to do that. Um, and so that's just some things that we have to look at. It's all on a case by case basis. And then whenever possible, schools should open windows, let circulating air. Um, we're talking about we do have to put out posters in an entire district. Um, on the first day, on the first day, students attend school on campus. School systems must provide instruction to students on appropriate hygiene practices and other mitigation practices adopted in the school system. So we will do that too. All right. Health and hygiene masks. I'll go over masks, masks here in a little bit. For the purpose of this document, masks include non-medical disposable face masks, cloth face coverings over the nose and mouth, or full face shields to protect the eyes, nose, and mouth. All right. Schools are required to comply with the governor's executive order regard, regarding the wearing of masks. All right. And I'll go over that here in a little bit because that was brand new today uh, from Governor Abbott and um, our local officials, uh, Judge Joe Schuster. And it may have been the mayor. I think it was both of them. Uh, good luck. Thank you, guys. Uh, I know it's tough making decisions for the best interests of the, of the, of the town and the county. So um, wish them well uh, and um, just do the best you can to. Uh, spread the good news and to be uh, accepting and patient with things that we we're dealing with. So shout out to the mayor and the judge. Uh, thank you for making tough decisions. We appreciate that. Um, it may be impractical for students who wear masks and patients while participating in some non-UL athletic or extracurricular activities. And that makes sense. Uh, sometimes there's certain things, uh, even uh, we have students who are doing speech. It may be something where we have to have that face shield or we have to move some things around. Um, and so there are some things that we have to consider, and that's going to be a case-by-case -case issue whenever we have issues in a classroom. Uh, Student-teacher groups, when feasible, without disrupting the educational experience, encourage students to practice social distancing. So that's the crazy thing. TEA says, we're feasible, without disrupting the educational experience, encourage students to practice social distancing. Those of you who have teenagers, we can encourage them to make the right choices, and sometimes they just kind of, they don't, they don't think. They're just kids sometimes. Everybody's a kid sometimes. And so we're going to, we are going to um, encourage students to practice social distancing, uh, but we can't promise it. I mean, even out in public, you know, we encourage it. Uh, but again, it's not a 100% thing that's going to happen. All right. In classroom spaces that allow it, uh, stay six feet apart, consider placing student desks. And so we've looked at that already. Uh, school should plan for more frequent hand washing, hand sanitizing, and should should consider whether increased airflow from outdoors is possible. Uh, use of non-classroom spaces. Uh, it does say if preferable for students to gather outside rather than inside. Uh, I don't know if we want our students out in, in the 100 degree weather that we've had in the last couple of weeks, but it's something that we, we would look at, okay? Uh, band, you know, sometimes practices, or well, they practice every morning outside. So um, there are opportunities when we can be outside. Some of the science classes can go to the... Um, Oh, what do you call that? The where they go outside and do experiments and things like that. So uh, it can be something that we can look at. Um, UIL, I will tell you this: that UIL was supposed to put something out today, and they did not. Uh, so who knows? We're all waiting. We don't know. Uh, we've been looking and reading and trying to figure out what they are going to tell us, and they were supposed to tell us something today, and they have not. So we're going to deal with the best we can. Um, and so uh, you know. Sorry, you all didn't put anything out. Um, campuses must plan for entry exit transition procedures that reduce large group gatherings of students and or adults in close proximity. The only thing I can say about that is we learned a lot during graduation on how to handle those things. And so uh, we handled a lot of people in a big setting. Uh, we're going to take a lot of what we learned then and kind of put it into practice as far as what we've done in the schools as well. Uh, depending on local conditions, school systems should consider eliminating assemblies and or other activities that bring large groupings of students and our teachers and staff together. Uh, that's things like pep rallies and things like that. Sorry, I know that, but we, that's not in the best interest of anybody in situations that we were dealing with today. Uh, consider adding dividers. We've looked at that as well. Uh, transportation. Uh, we went over the transportation thing last week. It's basically the same thing. 
about disinfecting things and keeping hand sanitizer on board. Visits to schools. Parents and other students can visit as permitted by local system school system policies. Parents and other visits must follow virus prevention and mitigation requirements of the school. School systems should restrict visits in school to those essential to school operations. All right, so it tells you they can visit, but it also says you should restrict visits in schools to only those essential to school operations. That's a touchy subject because we know that we're going to have kids coming to school and it's if we can keep the less amount of people in the building, because I will tell you this, um, all the things that we're having to put in place, um, we're doing every single day to help prevent the spread of COVID-19, just like the hospital is. And so I, I don't know uh, what's going on in other places, and hopefully they're doing that as far as um, here in town or at your home, whatever. But I know at schools are set to a standard that we have to do all these things, and it's real important for us to do that. So the less people we can get inside that building, the better chance we have of spreading it because the, it's in a confined space um, as far as, you know, whether it's a classroom or what have you. So um, it may be something where you just drop your students off. And I get it. You know, I drop my drop off my kids to daycare and they're stuck at the door and they take their temperature and they go in. Um, and and it's some, some days it does hurt me, you know, uh, but I, I have to believe in my heart that um, it's here in the best interest of them and for the rest of the kids in that classroom and the staff members as well. Uh, employees of school system, like employees for any other organization, must continue to meet work expectations set by the employers, subject to any applicable employment contract terms and legal requirements. Um, to have school, you have to have teachers teaching some way or form or another. Um, and so, yes, we will have teachers in our buildings, and we've spoke to our principals and kind of had some things laid out to help it make it easier for them. Um, but again, and the, and the whole idea is to be safe for everybody in the building. Um, it, could, it could include schedules to ensure uh, schedules, modification of schedules where feasible. Uh, school teachers and staff should be trained specifically on protocols outlined in this document and practices. I will tell you this. Uh, the people who were working this summer had to get trained again. They got trained on summer uh, COVID-19 practices, and they'll, be, they'll get trained again for how we're going to handle back-to-school um, training, back-to-school opening of schools as well. School systems should attempt to reduce in-person staff meetings, which we've been doing that, or other opportunities for adults to congregate in closed settings. It does say if you have to, if best you can, keep people as, part, as far apart as you can, six feet, of, six feet apart. Um, here are the symptoms, all right? Um, same things, right? We've talked about those before. Here's the definition of close contact, what close contact means, <laughs> all right? It means being directly exposed to infectious secretions, for example, being coughed on while not wearing a mask or face shield, or being within six feet of cumulative duration of 15 minutes while not wearing a mask or face shield. So when someone says close contact, these are the rules that we have to play by when it comes to, uh, Texas Education Agency as determined by the appropriate public health agency. And so this is what we know as of today. Um, individuals are presumed infectious at least two days prior to symptom onset in the case of an asymptomatic individual or lab confirmed COVID-19 two days prior to the confirmed lab test. That is a huge sentence of trying to figure out what we have to do. Basically, it's saying we have to consider people may be positive um, two days before their test. Uh, so I am thinking it has to do with the fact that, you know, you got to go back and look and say, well, at least two days before, who are you in contact with? I think that has to do with contact tracing. So just want to let you know that is in there as well. And again, it's a TEA document. The screening questionnaire information must only require the individual to provide a yes or no to the overall statement that they are symptomatic for COVID-19. So it is a collective yes or no. That is the end of the document. Um so i just wanted to let you know so going back to and i'll go back to the whole school part the, the biggest confusion was this right here this statement right here how we handle what are we doing in schools okay and so again they are giving schools four week you know four weeks to do virtual learning but uh and it says you may require students to be remote instruction temporarily but it says although any family member who does not have internet access or device learning is still entitled to have their student receive on-campus instruction each day for their transition period. That also includes on our end, anybody who uh, has to send their kid to school. I mean, we get it. I mean, we don't need our kids to, to be at home alone. 
um, we'll do the very best we can. Uh, with that being said, teachers will still be teaching as well. You know, they'll be in their classrooms. Um, at school, we'll, we'll, well, we'll still feed kids and we'll still bus kids if we have to. We're going to bus kids and feed kids just like how we normally would if they were going to school. Um, so that is that document. Let's see what comes next. Okay, again, virtual learning. I am going to switch to a different screen. Uh, new share. All right. I switched to a different screen now. Uh, this was the screen that we looked at the guidance. This here is a four week virtual learning. Parents still have a choice. You still have a choice to do learning at home or face to face. That is your parents' choice. You have every right to do that. If you change your mind, I will tell you this right now. If you have any questions specifically to what a campus is going to do, call that campus up. There, there are people answering the phones at the campuses this week. Uh, please call them because what's happening at, at, at high school in band class or athletics or choir or English class or whatever class is maybe different from what's happening at Apache or Alamo second grade elementary class, okay? Please call them. Uh, attend the school if, so example, so kids must attend the school if they don't have internet, don't have a device, or they have to be in school because mom and dad are working, all right? Not a big deal. Send them, because uh, our staff will still be working. Uh, we'll be doing the best we can to provide the best education with what we have and the very best um, in the safest in, lear in learning environment we can possibly do that. Because if they're not safe, there's no way they can learn. Um, school registration all right now here's the big thing we had uh, some glitches with school registration today um and so we are working on that principals worked on that all day today the, to get some things worked out uh please be patient with us i know that we had phone calls to every campus every campus here school board members got phone calls messages i get it guys we are in the same boat trying to figure out what we can i do know that we're probably a lot of people are are, are trying to figure out what fort stockton is doing um, because we are one of the first, you know, we were one of the first campuses to do uh, graduation, one of the first campuses to uh, figure out what to do with school and how to start school. And so please be patient with us because as soon as that registration is up, as soon as it is up, we are going to send a school messenger, an email, a text message, put it on Facebook, Twitter, uh, send a message to Steve Fountain um, and the Pioneer, uh, Ken Ripley. Um, so we will we will put that out as fast as we can. We were hoping it was today. We knew, if you remember on Friday when you watched the, the Facebook Live, I was a little concerned because I knew we were going to have some glitches and, and we were trying to avoid that. But uh, sure enough, it happened. And so please be extremely patient with us. As soon as it comes out, we will update every social media aspect we have plus uh, the uh, media that we are aware of and send a school messenger a phone call system at home. So, But the bus registration is ready. Um, and so I can show you that what that looks like here. If you go to the, I'm going to sh new share. All right. If you go to, um, I'm hoping you can see this. If you go to, yes, you can. Um, you go here and I think it is down here. These are just reminders. See that 2020-21 school year information? It is right here. If you click right there, and I think some of you already filled out the bus information, believe it or not. I think Mr. Sanchez sent me a, a message that said, hey, it's done. The bus registration is here. Okay. Now, people say, well, how you do I don't even know if I'm going to school. We do know today that there are some kids that are going to have to get on the bus. They've already called, uh, said there's no way. Um, so that form is there. And there is the link there as well. So I'm just going to click on this. Uh, make sure that it comes up. Hopefully it does. Uh, you will look at the information there. It has just the information. It's just very similar to the other form that you filled out whenever uh, students were doing the um, form of, or parents were filling out the form, letting us know if they want to go to um, at home learning or face to face. Uh, you hit next there is the handbook right there all right and it's you can print it off you can download it you can print it off uh, you do have to hit next yes click next and then you fill out the information here first middle name last 
student ID if you have it. If you don't have it, not a big deal. But if you do, please put it in there. The physical address, gender, campus name, grade level, parent guardian name, parent guardian physical address, um, parent guardian email, parent guardian home number, a cell phone number, uh, a work number. If you say, well, I don't have one number. Well, just put it right there. If you notice, the cell phone number is the most important one. Put in the number there. This one is an option. This is an option. And then we're also asking for other uh, contact information. Uh, it may be an aunt, an uncle, uh, just first name, last name, and the contact phone number. And then we want to know if you are an employee of Fort Sock Nice D. Um, and then pick up and drop off options. Uh, this right here is on there as well. If you say no, you still, you do have to hit yes or no. Um, and then no. Um, if you say no, there's pick up and drop up drop off instructions morning only afternoon only or both and then any specific information that would help us to serve you and your child at the schools uh, it can be hey um i only need my kids picked up on mondays and fridays because tuesday wednesday and thursday i'm off S anything you name it anything that will help us you hit submit i'm not gonna hit submit because i didn't fill out the form correctly if you need it in spanish it is right there uh, Mr. Sanchez has done a pretty good job of getting that. He'll have to fix that one right there. But he's done a pretty good job of getting this in Spanish. And it is a tough deal. So we are good to go on that form. That is that form. Let me go back to my presentation. All right. Uh, so bus registration, I showed you where it was at. Devices. We are working on a checkout system. Um we are working on a checkout system for devices to let parents check out devices. Um, and we did like we kind of did in the springtime. There was a lot of parents who said, well, I need a Chromebook. And so we did check out Chromebooks to students. We did a lot of that in the uh, in, in the springtime. So we're going to continue to do that. OK, now masks. I want to show you the executive order from the governor. Uh, new share. All right, this is the governor's order. Check the, okay, this is the governor's order from the masks, okay? It was dated back on July 2nd. It's governor's order GA29. This is what we have to follow uh, that we got information from Mr. Uh, Judge Joe Schuster, uh, and I believe it was the mayor. Uh, and it just basically says, requiring the use of face coverings as a target response to combat the threat of public health using least restrictive means. Whew, okay, good. Then it says failure to comply with any executive order issued during COVID-19 disasters and offense punishable under section 4.8173. This isn't me. This is just the governor. He's what he's put out and what Pecos County has to follow. And so it, it says it is punishable by a fine. And it basically says every person in Texas shall wear a face covering over the nose and mouth when inside a commercial entity or other building or space open to the public or when an outdoor public space, how, wherever it is not feasible to maintain six feet of social distancing from another person, not in the same household. Not in the same household is very important. For example, if I work in the office here and Delilah Urias is not related to me, we're not in the same household. So if she comes in my office, she has to wear a mask, okay? Um, if we're in the same vehicle, and I'll go over here and look, if we're in the, in the vehicle together and I'm riding along with uh, one of the maintenance guys who is not related to me, we have to wear masks. Um, if we were related, living in the same household, we didn't have to wear a mask. But since we are not related we and we do not live in the same household, uh, I think that's the issue. You have to live in the same household because I guess you wouldn't, you didn't have to be related, but if you live in the same household, so that's what it basically is. If you live in the same household, you can be in the same room together, not a big deal, not wear a mask. You can do that. If you live, uh, if you're in the car, you live in the same household, you can be fine. Now, it also says these things do not apply. These these group of people here do not have to wear a mask. Any person younger than 10 years of age, all right? Uh, but going back to what we're going to do at the elementary campuses for people who are who are going face-to-face, -face, we are going to provide face shields for, for our students, okay? Uh, we're going to provide face shields, I think, at Alamo, Intermediate, and Apache. I know Alamo and Apache for sure, and I think Mrs. Urias was also looking at that as well. Uh, we're also going to provide that for our staff there as well. Um, and I know every campus is, is also looking at getting face shields for their, their staff. So any person with a medical condition or disability that prevents wearing a face covering. So again, uh, now here's the thing. We're not going to go out and, and give you 37 questions to figure out if that medical condition or disability 
is legit or not. And that's not in the place we are. We're going to take it for face value and say, you know what? I, I have this. I can't wear a mask. You know what? That's fine. Not a big deal. Uh, any person, uh, of course, if you're eating food or sitting, sitting in a restaurant, you don't have to wear a mask. If you're exercising outdoors, maintaining a safe distance from each other with people who are not in your same household, any person while a person is driving alone or with passengers who are part of the same household as drivers. So if you're driving alone, you don't need to wear a mask. If you have passengers, you don't have to wear a mask if those people live with you. If they don't live with you, they have everybody's got to wear a mask. Uh, if you're going to the bank, and I get it, if you're going to the bank, it, it might be important for people to see you and see your face to make sure that you are who you are. Uh, and I guess that's even good at schools. I, I, if we have someone who needs to check out a kid at school or they say who they are and you got to have a whole mask, mask, a whole face covering, they may, we may have to ask you to, <laughs> to show us your face. Um, it's just a safe practice at that point. Uh, swimming in pool, lakes, or in a body of water. Uh, if you're going to vote, if you're working as a voting assistant or assisting a voter, serving as a poll watcher, you do not have to wear a mask. Uh, it's strongly encouraged, though. Any person who is actively providing and obtaining access to religious worship, but okay, so what it's saying is you don't have to wear a mask if you're going to a religious worship, but they do say wearing a face covering is strongly encouraged. So that's just the governor's order, not my orders, not the school's orders, not Joe Schuster's order, not the mayor's order, <laughs> Governor Abbott's orders. Uh, anybody giving a speech, you don't have to wear a mask, and then it goes on and on and on. Uh, not accepted not expect not accept accepted from this face cover requirement is any person attending protest oh this is what this means this says if you're doing a protest uh and you can't and there's more than 10 people and you can't do six feet apart then you gotta wear a mask that's what that means especially if it's people not in the same household um it does show the fine here is 250 but it does say you cannot go to jail it says the first time violator is a is a warning the second is a violation that can Write you a ticket for $250 violation. Uh, executive order hereby prohibits confinement in jail. Uh, in other words, they can't throw you in jail. Uh, this is kind of unique. Executive order GA20 is hereby amended to delete from paragraph number 15 the phrase, but no jurisdiction can impose a civil or criminal penalty for failure to wear a face covering. So, Governor's Order GA28 did say you cannot impose any criminal penalties or because people don't wear a mask. Now they're saying they're doing away with it. So that was GA29. Um, that was filed in our clerk's office here on July 2nd at 2.30 p.m. signed by Governor Abbott. There was a attestation that Joe Schuster signed that said we did not have to follow these rules. We had it on file. Uh, and then, as you know uh, from the information that was put out today, that um, let me stop sharing. that um we, we have to do that now okay so let me go back to my other screen we went over masks all right one more thing there are some reminders that i'm going to go into help to remind you just a reminder that there is the survey at home uh the survey which tells us if you're at home learning or face to face the pebt the census 2020 please if you haven't done that as well please fill it out we did talk about a mask uh, I'm, i am going to go over some more information that was put out on thursday I mean, Friday, it's about 27 pages long, and it is long. So I will go over that as well. Um, and so I'm going to stop sharing. And hopefully I, we've been on the line for a, who knows how long, probably too long. Um, somebody asked a question. So uh, schools are not going to have Chromebooks. Yes, we are. We're, we, we checked out Chromebooks. I think every campus did. Middle school, intermediate, Alamo, Apache. We all checked out Chromebooks uh, to... Um, to people now we are looking at um doing some things and checking out chromebooks there may be a fee involved uh for that just to for insurance purposes and so i know that uh, the principals and the technology department are looking at that i know at the high school level they did uh pay a fee at the high school level and the thing about it is is yes uh, you know you do pay that fee uh, but i know at the high school level once those seniors were graduated we they they got to keep their chromebook you know um, and so I know that there's probably going to be a fee involved. I just don't know exactly how much it is. Uh, the next question is going to be, what about school supplies? Do we got to buy all the school supplies? Um, I will tell you this right now. I know that the, the elementary principals especially are looking at that because um, there are some supplies that, you know, students do need in the classroom. But if they're not going to be in the classroom, they'll be at home. Uh, you know, then we, we look at the other end of that spectrum as far as, 
you know, Mr. Alvarado at the high school, once they went to Chromebooks for every student, they um, did away with a lot of the supplies that they were needing. My best advice, because I, I don't have all the answers to every campus. I wish I did. I, I wish I, I knew everything all the time, but I do not. And I appreciate those of you who understand that. Uh, although there's a lot of people out there that are asking 1,001 questions, and I get it, I, you know. But I will tell you this. If you call your campus first, they'll be the ones to kind of tell you exactly what you need. Because someone's going to ask me, what does my kid need for his sixth grade art class? And I'm going to tell you something. I do not have the sixth grade art class supply list memorized. So I'm sorry. So it's just different things like that. So I know it, it sounds, you know, that things probably people don't want to hear, but I will tell you this, the best thing to do is call your campus, call your campus and ask to get a, uh, information. If they don't have an answer, say, can you do, can you, can you leave a number and a message for the principal to call me uh, and do that? Leave your number and say, Hey, you know, and if you have a specific time you'd like for them to call you, cause I know some of you guys work, um, you know, just jot it down. If somebody says, no, I, you call me because I need to know. Because when people ask questions here, they can be very specific to things that we just don't know a whole lot of, especially at the campus level when they're doing it. Um, it's, it's just hard to know exactly every single thing that's going on in every single campus and department, whether it's transportation or, or, or special services or food services and then the campuses and then technology. I would tell you this, there was a question that somebody asked earlier and is, what do I do with my child who gets speech? Well, like we did in the spring, our wonderful speech pathologists and special ed uh, department and special services department, they helped uh, with doing a lot of speech online on the, you know, the best thing is, is, is face to face. We get that. Whether it's teaching, whether it's being at the doctor's office, whether <clears throat> it's providing a service, the best thing is face to face. But unfortunately, we're not able to do that. So what we need to do is come up with a different ways to do that. And so it may be a Zoom meeting. It may be something that you do. We do have to meet face to face somewhere. OK, um, with all that being said, each person is very specific. So I can't sit here and say, um, all right, well, we're doing all speech therapy uh, through Zoom. Well, we really can't say that because there may be people who don't have the ability to do Zoom. There may be a situation where some people are like, you know what, I really need my kid here doing speech at school because they do better with speech at school with 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 with, with doing it with you. Um, so there's all kinds of different scenarios and it's real hard to nail something down. So I would tell you this, the best thing to do is to contact your campus um, and ask them what is going on. So whew, that was a lot. I don't know how long we've been on here. Probably too long for some of you. Going back to registration, we know it's supposed to be out today. I know people have been calling me and, and my family members because they think my family members know all the answers. And sometimes I don't even tell them because they don't, it doesn't do any good to tell them because sometimes I don't know the answers. Uh, people have been calling central office. If you be patient with us, it's, it's almost online. Um, we're not going to turn kids away. Worst come to worst. We're making phone calls. Um, so other than that, I think I'm done. Um, Whew, that's quite a bit of information, and I think we've probably been on close to an hour. It has to be. It has to be close to an hour. All right. That being said, thank you very much. Take your time. This this will be recorded. Well, it's on Facebook Live, so it's there forever. Um, as soon as we get information, we'll, we'll put it out. We will do. We will send out information to everybody about online registration once it's open and live. Um, the bus registration is out. Uh, We've already had people fill it out. Okay, do you have to do the bus registration first, or or the or the online registration for your kid? However you want to do it, they don't work hand in hand, so that's why we kind of need it. Plus, we kind of need the bus registration a lot sooner than we do the online registration because Mr. Bradshaw uh, at the uh, transportation department that has to do it, look at all that, kind of put it together, and figure out what we need to pick up kids and how to help train bus drivers and what they need to do, and so. Um, be patient with him. Be patient with us. We have a lot of people doing a lot of things to make things work. And it is 713, 713. I need to let you guys go because I am tired and I appreciate you being with us today. Thank you for being patient. Um, if you have any questions, please call your campus. And so, and like I said, um, leave a message. It says, hey, can you have Principal Cordova, Principal Urias, Principal Chavez, Principal Alvarado, Principal McAllister call me? Uh, here's my number. I know you guys are busy. Uh, call me and I have a question, you know, I'd like to run this by you, you know, because every situation can be a little different. Uh, and it's hard to put a whole cookie cutter situation for every kid because kids are not cookie cutter. <laughs> They're not. Um, 
So thank you very much. Have a good night, good evening, and we'll hope we may do something tomorrow. I like to do around this time because I'm thinking everybody's home at this time because uh, I don't need people missing work to listen to me talk. That's for sure. So you guys have a great day, great evening, and be safe. Thank you.